Welcome to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. This podcast series is an extension of our film's mission to firm and extol the courage, strength, and joy in our LGBTQ plus community through the preservation and sharing of our personal stories and the collective histories we live through and change. I'm your host, Wanda Acosta. In this episode, we welcome Zuhair Nasher, a queer-identified, first-generation Yemeni-American. He is a successful risk manager in finance and tech, an amazing marriage officiant, and an all-around fierce human. Welcome, Zuhair. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. It's great to see you here in New York City, Zuhair. When I first met you, it was in Puerto Rico, and I thought you were the sweetest, most handsomest, gentle man. I'd love to know more about you. Why don't you tell us your story? Oh, thank you. I'm from uh, Jamaica, Queens, New York, which is not always like the words you use are not always the way you would describe the place I grew up. And but, you know, I would because I'm from there. I grew up in a place where it was where it was expected that you came from somewhere else, where it was expected that before you walked into someone's house, you looked around to see if you should take off your shoes, where you walked in expecting someone's mama to feed you and you better eat, you know? When you grow up in a place where everyone is different, that and that is the expectation. You grow up with an, an awareness that you have to observe, you have to communicate, you have to be respectful of these differences. And so when I, I love meeting people, I didn't realize you were from New York also, but then when I found out you were, I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, New York is such a melting pot and Queens is, you know, particularly mm-hmm. a mixed bag of so many ethnicities and groups of people and cultures. What is your background culturally? Yes. So I'm an Arab American. I was born in New York, but I am the sixth of seven kids. And my parents and older siblings were born in Yemen. My dad arrived in New York in around the mid 70s with his best friend, worked for a while and did as many Yemeni men do. They arrive first, leaving their families behind, make some money, send some coins in the interim. But then when they have enough, if they're going to put down roots here, then eventually they'll bring their family over. So my dad brought my mom and the kids over in 1980. My mom during that trip was pregnant with number four. So then the next four kids were born in New York. Um, so, so yes, my family's from Yemen, AKA the other Puerto Ricans of New York. You know, it's <laughs> like, if I'm hanging out with your people, they thought I was Puerto Rican. Hello. We took over the bodegas from y'all, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, we, this is a special kinship here for sure. That is hysterical. That's <laughs> true, actually. <laughs> Right? We That's true. Over. I never actually thought about, you're yeah, right, the bodegas, they got taken yeah, over. Like people and then, like, wait, it's a Spanish word. Why all the Arabs work in there? Uh-huh. They used to be all Puerto Rican. And that then the, the ones thing. that weren't so aware would still think you were Puerto Rican and come in talking to you in Spanish. And you're like, mm, I don't understand. Right? <laughs> Puerto Rican's like, we done with this, but y'all look like us. And let me see how you make a sandwich. All right. All right. You, all right, you <laughs> you're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> In the four kids that were then born in the U.S., how do you fit yeah. into the four? I'm number six of seven. So of the four kids, I'm the second to okay. last of those. Six of seven overall. I was five boys, two girls, and I'm the youngest boy. And uh, I have a little sister who was, who was born um, kind of like a, a long time after me. So for a while, I was a baby for a while, and then she came in and stole the spotlight. Although it's not really much spotlight in that scenario. Like the, the youngest just means like, you know, you, you get picked on and you got to do all the chores. Right. But one thing that changed a bit was when I was around 13, my parents and about half my family actually moved back to Yemen. By that point, they had been here for a long time. And I think the plans were always to, you know, take some good American dollars back to Yemen where that you can get a lot further with them. And they did that. I was at a point where they initially expected that I would go. And actually it was an expectation. It was kind of by decree. We we went to Yemen and it was during that trip when I was 13, they told me like literally right before the trip. So by the way, like we're moving there and you're living in Yemen now going forward. And I was always like a really kind of shy, obedient kid at home just because of the nature of our family dynamic. You know, very large immigrant family, 
very tight margins. You know, dad came home from work and uh, seen but not heard kind of situation with the kids. And so really like obedient, my older brothers got into trouble, but I was the shy, quiet one. But when I heard about that, they were going to move me over. That's probably the first time I really found my voice in the house because deep down I knew that that wasn't going to work for me in a way that was more than some of the obvious things, you know, in terms of just changing culture, missing your friends, things like that. I was like, oh no, this is a life or death thing for me. And it really struck a chord for me. And so it was kind of one of the earliest steps I remember taking of claiming like my future of saying like, no, like, you know, mom, even to my parents, which is unheard of to look your parents in the face and say, no, where I'm from. But yeah, so that was a a really interesting thing and finding my, uh, my opportunity to kind of put my foot down and it's the best decision I think I ever made. So you're 13 years old and you are somewhat hesitant to move back to Yemen with your family. Is that hesitancy because you have an awareness of your sexual identity and have some fears about what that might mean going back to Yemen? I think it was more subconscious. Doesn't mean it wasn't um, strong. It, It was certainly pronounced. The message was clear as day if I didn't know exactly why. I wouldn't say I was hyper aware of my own sexuality. I certainly hadn't dabbled really in anything at that point yet, but I knew from actually, you know, a much earlier age that I was different in a way that I could not tell anyone. I was different in a way that could affect my safety, even in my own home. And when you live in, you know, a converted three bedroom apartment with nine people, you know, you don't have any personal space. And so if you feel like you can't be seen, but you can't help that because we're all on top of each other, this idea of living a double life, of hiding your feelings, and and what I mentioned before about growing up in Queens in, in a certain neighborhood that it wasn't necessarily the best, but it wasn't that bad, but, you know, you just had to know how to get around. So always being observant and evaluating every situation, every scenario, to what extent can I express myself here? What can I do that could get me in trouble, that could get me jumped, get my ass kicked, like whatever. And certainly, you know, going to Yemen, it was a culture shock for me, even though we ate Yemeni food, my parents spoke Arabic, things like that. But when you go there, you know, it's a different ballgame. And I quickly realized that the expectations and of masculinity and things like that, that I dealt with that were very difficult, even in New York, over there, it wasn't so much as an expectation, such as it was really the only way to do things. And there was no alternative. There was no question of a choice there. That I always knew. Whereas I knew in the U.S. there was a thing called choice. So you were aware that there could be implications for you to be a different type of man in Yemen. Yes. To your question, I knew that for me, no matter where I was, there was something in me that was budding and something in me that I was dealing with. I didn't realize or completely exactly know how that would manifest or what that would look like. But I felt like in New York, I had time to figure it out. You know, I could play the game. Like I knew, you know, I knew how to get around. I know the subways around here. I could bounce. I can't handle my business around here. But over there, I would have been completely dependent. I wouldn't have had really any alternatives. At least that is what I thought. Right. You know, as a 13 year old. And for that kind of burgeoning pressure inside of me, there would not be a safe outlet for that over there, for sure. It was beyond just your sexual identity. It was also just your level of being able to express yourself as a young man, having this experience in Queens and New York City, to then have this culture shock of of a more, for lack of a better word, repressed society. Certainly, I would say, you know, repressed in terms of individual expression. Absolutely. And I think it's getting a lot better. And, you know, things like the internet, I haven't like lived there other than, you know, spending summers there and things like the internet are changing things. And I know there's amazing things going on there. And I believe so much in the the youth of the country now, despite the very formidable circumstances they face. However, I certainly didn't feel like that was the case for me. Absolutely. So did your family move? They did. And uh, so I said, so I'll go with you for the summer, but I'm coming back. I mean, I slept with my passport, you know, it was like, I'm for real. Like I was like, I just made it very clear. And we managed to get to that understanding right before we left. You know, my dad was, I remember him asking around, like, what's wrong with your brother? Like, they never saw me like that. They were more shocked than angry because they'd never seen me not be this obedient kid. As they defaulted to the position that many immigrant parents do, which was, all right, if you do well in school, we'll let you stay. Meaning that they kind of 
associate a good kid, quote unquote, with a kid who does well in school. You know, it's because that's this idea of opportunity and making the most of American opportunity. You know, when you're older, it's about working. When you're younger, it's about an education. And so if that wasn't the fire I needed, I did well in school. I'm I'll tell be you that. the best student you know? you've ever seen. <laughs> like <laughs> I was not messing around because there are poor guys who going to get sent back. So I felt like, you know, one slip up and this right. they sent my ass back. So. Yeah. So you spend the summer there, then you come back. You're you're quite young. Who are you staying with? Who are you living with? So my older brothers, the ones who stayed, um, we were living with them in the house that my parents had bought. And my older brothers, several of them were married, had kids by then. So some of them moved back into the house and my parents were like, all right, have your wife cook for the younger boys and, you know, just like gonna watch out for them and let them work in the store. My dad owned the grocery store. So, you know, keep an eye out and send me the report cards and, you know, buy the groceries, but, you know, we'll take care of the mortgage and whatever. So it was a good deal for them. It was a good deal for us. And it was this weird thing because I remember thinking like, wait, this is kind of weird. Like my parents are gone. They just kind of just up and moved because they want to live that good life. I can't be mad at them. They sacrifice so much. They work so hard. I never begrudged them for it. I knew that they worked so hard. I, I saw the struggle like up close and personal for so long. And the idea of living, them living a good life was, I was happy about that. I did miss them for sure. I missed my little sister who moved back with them. She was kind of my one opportunity to be an older sibling for. And, you know, I had kind of a rough relationship with some of my older siblings. And once I got to a point where I was a teenager and, you know, I, I didn't really realize how much I loved her and missed her until we were in Yemen and I was leaving, but she was going to stay. It's just my little like runt sister. You never thought about it. And then we were leaving and I was just like broken. Like I just felt so sad. And it made me really conscientious of important relationships. That was one of the big lessons I learned from that whole experience. It just hit me. We have an amazing opportunity to be someone important in each other's lives here. And I also felt guilty because she was staying and I had all these horrible ideas of what it meant for me to stay. So I felt guilty in a way like, wait, like, did I escape and leave her behind kind of thing, you know? Some of that guilt, I think, kind of manifested in me taking a very active role in her life, you know, sending her all the books that I knew that she wouldn't be able to read over there to also to keep up with her English, but also to make sure she's growing up and maturing in the way I wanted to. And, you know, like women in Yemen, like they, they're supposed to act a certain way and all that. But I'm like, you need to know, you need to know what's going on, you know? And I, I, that was very important to me. So it became very thoughtful about how we stayed uh, in, uh, in contact. Okay, so now you're a teenager and you're having all these feelings and you're much more aware of your sexual identity. What does that mean for you and what does that mean for you and your relationship with your family and how do you decide to come out to them? So one of the kind of early catalysts for me, it was, you know, it's kind of random, but I, I would say significant is I randomly stumbled into a book that one of my brothers needed for a college course they were taking. And they took a course called Understanding Human Sexuality. And I found that book. I, I got some college credits that summer. I was about nine years old. I don't think I, I left the attic that summer. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, That's like me when I found the joy of sex while right, I was babysitting. Oh, yes. It was like, it was <laughs> was like, like oh, really? She's so sweet, always babysitting <laughs> our kids, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just loves kids. I probably learned more than a nine-year-old was. And, you know, my it was one thing that I, I have to laugh at. My mom didn't really speak English very well. There was at least once or twice she came in a room like vacuuming and reading this book that you couldn't tell anything from the outside of what it was. And she's like, you are always reading like this boy. And I'm like, thank you, but don't come closer, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I learned a lot, but that was more, you know, that's like facts. I was nine, you mm -hmm. know, I, I didn't really understand all these things, but I learned what it was to be homosexual. I, I learned that that like really was like a thing. I, I don't think I had ever really even thought about that idea before. And so that was kind of just, you know, a seed that was planted kind of thing. But certainly, you know, as any young person does, they have certain, you know, these feelings that you can't describe kind of thing. And so that was always there. But I knew that in general, I couldn't talk about that. And that wasn't just the gay thing. As I mentioned, you know, kind of in, in a strict uh, immigrant household, anything regarding romance or sexuality, that was not something mm -hmm. a family would ever talk about right. uh, in a situation where everyone in my family essentially got an arranged marriage. So even this idea of even dating, I knew that was a conversation that, that would never be had. Um, you know, maybe at some point on the low with my brothers and stuff like that, you know, but certainly not openly. And so I was kind of holding that stuff in. And then those feelings, of course, 
grow as you're a teenager and your sexual feelings start to manifest and, you know, more profoundly. And then this crazy thing happened when I was around 16 and it was called America Online. <laughs> and, you know, that's a, that's a game changer for, rooms. yeah, NYC, M4M or whatever. Right, right, things, right. You know, all these things. And then like, you know, in the big cities, like, you know, there would be like 10 of those chat rooms because there were so many people. And it was this crazy thing. Like you could just almost feel like the desperation of like people like contacting each other, you know, like, and especially people who felt like they could never do express these things in real life. Mm -hmm. It was this wild thing. And I don't blame like anyone in my family for letting me get into that stuff because you couldn't have stopped me like at that point. Once I realized what that was and I was around 16, I think when we had access to it. And then that was an opportunity to actually start meeting people. And I thought about it for a while, but of course I was, I was scared. I very much had this idea as many men did that sex could kill you, even though I didn't have gay friends, but you know, I read the books and I, I you saw what you saw, you heard what you heard. The only things, you know, that mm -hmm, were in the movies mm -hmm. were about things like that. Mm -hmm. So I was terrified and I certainly didn't have anyone to talk about these things, but after a certain amount of time, you know, those feelings, you know, take over and they had their way to an extent. So I started meeting guys off the internet and things like that. And then at, as scary as it was, especially the first couple experiences, I'm lying about my age and things like that, all this crazy stuff stuff. But at the same time, I, I did feel confident in my ability to protect myself just as a New Yorker. Like, you know, I'm taking the subway. I'm not getting in your car. If I can't get home on my own, you know, it's not happening kind of thing. You know how to feel people out. I feel like I managed to come off as intimidating enough in such a way where I felt like, you know, I, I would be in, a, in an environment that was safe and or at least recognize one that wasn't pretty soon. And clearly practicing safe sex as well. Absolutely. For me, that has always been the case. I, super important. And, you know, there was always like some level of paranoia about that. And that's something that many gay men have been dealing with, you know, for, for so long and it's starting to change a bit. But but yeah, so that was absolutely part of it. So once all these, you know, there's a 10 point checklist and once all these conditions are met kind of thing, then you can go ahead and, and all right, let's do this, you know. And um, and that was kind of how I explored, but it was completely secret, double life. Okay, so now you're online, you're on AOL, and you've discovered these chat rooms for men, men for men. How are you finding like-minded dates and people to kind of meet up with? Are they younger people, older people? And how do you begin to navigate this like online sex world? I would say they were generally older. I was 16. I think I was telling them I was 19. I was like, because wait, 18 is legal. So let me do like one more for, you know, just extra protection, you know? So how did that feel when you actually like had this experience that you had been thinking about yeah, I mean, it was it was scary for sure. Um, the first couple experiences, man, like you know, I'll, I'll save them for the memoir. But like you know, there was there was some scary shit. Like the first one was deep in the hood. I mean, I was just going through areas that on my own I would never go to. I was like, what am I doing here? And then it was just this like you know this very scary thing. And yeah, the guy was, I think, you know, it was not uncommon to lie about your age. He was older than he said. I had never even drank alcohol. I remember we kissed. I remember like, oh, this is what alcohol is like. <laughs> you know, he was just like, it was the scary situation. Strangely, on my way out, he sensed that I was younger than I said I was. And he didn't try to scare me, but I, I think he tried to educate me. He was like, you know, be careful. Like not everyone out there will be as nice to you as I was kind of thing. And mm -hmm. it was like, my first reaction is like in the moment, is that a threat or something? But then I heeded that. I never forgot it. And deep down, I, I think he did it for my own good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was some things like that, but you know, sometimes I met younger people and people were generally nice, you know, just all there for the same reason. It was a unique experience, but I would say it was more about just doing the thing, like just being there, like going there the first time I kissed a guy, the first time like I, I met a guy like that. In the end, I wasn't thinking about how pleasurable the experience was. It was like, I did that, you know? Right. Like this thing you're always thinking about that you're always hiding. Right, right. I, it felt like for just like a, a minute, I could explore that. Yeah, and the I exploration. expressed that, des that desire and, and I had an experience. That's, mm -hmm. that's really what it was, right, you know? Right. Yeah. And did you feel like your brothers or anyone in your family had any sort of inclination that maybe you may have been exploring something else? Was anyone ever like, hey, do you have any girlfriends? How come you're not dating? Or did you bring girls home? Or At least at that time, I certainly didn't think they suspected that of me. I, I don't think anyone generally did. 
I didn't come off as what, you know, the stereotype of what people would have called effeminate for a man at that point. But there were definitely little things here and there with things that in the moment felt like a slip up. You know, I remember once one of my older brothers just be like, why you walk like that? You know, just like whatever. And I I had no idea what he meant. You know, I kind of still don't know exactly what he meant, but. I think the main thing that it was never a giveaway, but that maybe was pause for, you know, reflection for some people around me was I always had tons of female friends, as I still do. Even at a young age, it was so strange to me, this idea that like a boy couldn't be friends with a girl without arousing some kind of suspicion. You know, despite like the fact that I I grew up in a place where, you know, it was very gender segregated. I, I knew what the world was like, but it just never made sense to me. I could never accept it. I had an idea of what toxic masculinity was before that phrase existed mm-hmm, mm-hmm. at a very early age. But I think normally, uh, as many older brothers would, they were always asking like, oh, you know, do you have any girlfriends? Things like that. And I got tons of that. But when you're younger, it actually helps to have female friends because they see you walking with the chick and they're like, oh yeah, lady killer, you know, whatever. Uh-huh. Right, but right, right. Know, it was a good cover, right. Talking, it's like, oh, what you, what you put in your in your exes one? That was so nice. You know, it's like, they don't even know from far away. It looks like a mac in it. You know, when you get close, it's just like, oh, are your shoes? Oh, Ooh, I like that shirt. <laughs> Let me get that real quick. You know? <laughs> You know, <laughs> like, right. but, exactly. like, yeah, but my friends didn't know, but you know, and I was always an extrovert. I was always flirty, all that, whatever. So it was kind of like easy to, to get away with that stuff. And, you know, when I was a teenager. We had girlfriends, you know, I don't know about for you, but for me, like, you know, when you going out with somebody in New York, like I remember my first girlfriend, I went up to her and be like, you want to go out with me? And I think we were like 12 or 11. Yeah. And she was like, she's like, yeah. And I was like, yes. So and I walked my girlfriend. away and I was like, yeah, we going out. I don't think we ever went out. I think she called me once. She got my number. Like my mom answered or something. I was like, you trying to get me killed? You can't, you're a girl, you can't call my house. You know, and it was the Arab house. You can't do that. First day of seventh grade, I, I told Evelyn, I was like, yo, go over here and tell her we ain't going out no more. I was like, we never went out at all. <laughs> That's great. I love you know, that. But, That's um, totally what it was like. <laughs> but yeah, they would always ask. And then as I got older, that stuff was harder to, to get away with because then it's just like, well, wait, now, you know, but what's really happening? Like, who, you know, it's always this or that, but you always these things. But the question is starting to get a little more probing. And, you know, I would always get scared with those long car rides with my older brothers, you know, because that's what happens, you know, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. they want to live vicariously. They're getting, you know, they're married and stuff like that. And they right. want to know, and in their mind, they're asking from a good place. Like, I know what I was doing at your age. So, you know, put me on so I can put you on, like, you know, let you, you know, give you the advice and all that, whatever. And I knew that, but at the same time, I just lying, like, just got so hard. Like, it, it's when I first started to feel the weight of it, you know? It's like, each lie is just like a chip in the scale. And it's just like, oh, wait, what I told you last time? I got, you know, and it's, it became too hard. And then with school, like, my friends who were really supportive, they'd be like, you know, I got to a point, you go to these parties, and they'd be like, yo, this girl, like, she really likes you. And I'm like, oh, okay. And they'd be like, oh, no, no, she's like, if you, she's like in the backyard, like if you want to make out, like she's like waiting for you, whatever. I'm like, so what are you supposed to do? Everyone's right. like waiting for you, right. you know, whatever. Right. Right. No, right. You know, you got to like get spontaneously sick or some yeah. shit, like whatever. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. You know, for real. It's just like the pressure, like there was too many things like that happening. And it just, it started to weigh on me for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, I know exactly what that feels like. It was similar for me. I couldn't take the lies anymore and making up the stories and mm. mom asking all the time, like blah, blah, blah. And it just... It just was unbearable and I had to blurt it out. So how was it for you? Like, how did Mm. you finally liberate yourself from that burden of hiding? Yeah. So it didn't happen until later. I, uh, you know, as I mentioned, in in my mid-teens is when I started messing around. And that was that whole double life thing for a while. You know, I was just a little too good at it. Also really independent. So I was the only one to kind of move out for college and do all that stuff. So, and then I was in the middle of the city. So the city kind of gives you that cloak of anonymity, you know. It wasn't until after college. The first year after college, I was sharing a one-bedroom apartment with a good friend of mine in Queens. Uh, that you know, the only way we could afford it. And then uh, I got a, a job, and I was able to to get my own place. I met some guy that I think I met on one of those like Craigslist or one of those things. It wasn't supposed to be anything more, you know, but someone in the neighborhood. And we met first for I think for a tea or coffee or something. And then I just felt something kind of immediately. And I was not out at this point at all. And in fact, I would say up until the point that I was ready to come out, I would say I was almost at my peak stage of being a homophobe, which is absolutely how I I see myself at that point. You know, as the burden of the lie got heavier and heavier, so did my anxiety. And I never 
would mistreat or disrespect anyone, of course, at all. But with my close circle of guy friends who are also the ones around whom I felt some anxiety about these lies, I would absolutely be, you know, the loudest in terms of using these derogatory language and things like that. And I look back now and I'm so ashamed of it, but you know, they were the ones, they actually in that environment kind of chipped away and kind of set the stage for me because it was these straight guys who I wanted to convince who were the ones to be like, yo Z, calm down, man. It's just a gay dude, like, you know, mind your business, like whatever. And I'm like, wait, like, why am I like fronting for them? They think I'm an idiot because I'm in this guy's business and what I got to do with me? It was this weird thing where I caught myself, you uh-huh. know? And that was like, wow, okay, like mental note. And shortly after that, I met this guy who I fell for and he became my first boyfriend. He was a French man who was living in New York. He was a teacher and at a fancy French school in the Upper East Side. And him and many of his colleagues were in the same position, you know, relatively young French teachers who get sent around the world to teach in the French way. And they all like got the hot ticket to New York. And so he had a community of of French expats and he had been out like his entire life. And it was just to this day, we're we're very close. And he's just the epitome of just, you know, comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed hanging out with him so much. And I knew it wasn't just this like sexual thing where I just wanted to keep it on the side and walk away from it. Like I knew I wanted to spend time with him and we were neighbors practically. So we started hanging out a lot and I had just got my own place. So I suddenly for the first time had the opportunity to invite someone into my home to share things a bit more intimately without worrying about being caught. So my kind of soft coming out was him introducing me to his community. To me, coming out is more to the people who you perhaps weren't honest with in your own life, but I kind of almost got to audition. Like, this is what it's like to be introduced, start out, you know, on the right foot with Mm -hmm. people and just say who you are and not have to work backwards from a lie. And I was so nervous that first time and he was really sweet about it, but they were of course also wonderful. And it was amazing. I just, I remember like walking away from that first experience, meeting his friends and being introduced as his boyfriend and how natural that felt. It was just so obvious, like when you kind of enter this world and it feels like it's this new thing, but it's deep down, it's the way it always was, or at least the way it always should have been. I just felt like you took off the backpack. So being part of that community and being embraced by that community really was, and for almost the better part of a year, before I got to a point where I was like, you know, I love these people and they show me so much love. And if this is all I have in the world, then I'm a lucky person. But the people who have been in my life all this time, who I also love, they deserve the opportunity to love me back. And up to this point, I have not given them that opportunity because I have never shown myself to them in this way. And so I think I made the ultimatum with myself as many people, uh, queer people make, which is that I'm not gonna lie anymore. And that's what I said. This is at a point where everything was reaching a crescendo. You know, my family, the arranged marriage thing, it was nonstop. It was at a point where it was becoming a real barrier to even seeing my family because it was, it was such an issue. And the only way to avoid that was to avoid them. And so then you realize you're cutting out people in your life just to avoid the discomfort, but they don't know why. So Mm -hmm. they think you're just cutting out them. Right. And the pain of that, it's just this compounded guilt. So it was for that reason that I said, I'm not going to lie anymore. And when the next thing came, that was my opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it was a question from my brother out and kind of in a strange setting it was it was in Queens but it was that part of Astoria where like all the Arabs hang out and smoke hookah and all mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. you know my family was there and my brother started asking me some questions but we were kind of off on the side and he asked me something about a girlfriend or something like that and for the first time I didn't really say anything I said no not really no I'm not really doing anything like that with them and he was like are you doing like that at all like what like what do you mean and I was like well and then I don't remember exactly what I said but I answered each question honestly and he was catching on oh wow his first reaction was like you know in that moment he was like okay um look all right let's talk later you know because it was in a very public place and then so I left and then later that night I got a text from him and it was hey look really glad you told me let's meet up and talk more and all oh, that wow. and I oh, felt that's... so relieved And about a week later, we met up and we sat like at a cafe and he's like, all right, so, you know, the whole thing you told me about, thanks for telling me. I went there feeling like so good and just like whatever. And he was like, all right, so let's talk about what we can do to save you from going to hell. And I was like, oh, that's why you're happy I told you because now you can, you know, you know, swoop in and and, uh, And try to save you you and all that. So I just quickly just like, oh, okay. Well, that must have been a little disappointing, a little painful thinking that. Oh, okay. 
I said what I needed to say, and my brother's cool with this. He's yeah, accepting it, but yeah. no. Yeah, yeah. It was the 180. And like, because it's a double-edged sword, like what I described to you before about, you know, when you're living your truth and you feel like unburdened and you drop that backpack. But what that also means is you're vulnerable mm -hmm. because now you are living your life. Whereas before I was never vulnerable because right. I was on guard all the time. You weren't going to catch me, you know. And equally for them, you know, I think it's not always so easy for family to accept. And it takes a minute for them to actually be able to recognize their own, you know, issues around queer people, what it means for them. I know that in a lot of these conversations and in my own personal story, my coming out was a very much a reflection on mm. my mom and, mm. and some of the close friends that initially were like, wait, wait a minute, hold up. Like, you know, what does that mean for me? And I was like, it doesn't mean anything for you. This is my story, not right. yours, but I get it, you know, and it took a minute for them. You had to just hold your own. So how did that change for you? Yeah, you're totally right. And, um, and I recognize that. I believe that I showed a lot of deference or as much deference as I could to the struggles that my family would have had to go through to accept me. And I approached these conversations from the perspective of, you know, like, don't worry, you know, this kind of thing. And like, and of course, I really wanted them to accept me. But as they had all these questions, like hearing them out, I mean, for months, I, I felt like I tried so hard to have all these conversations with them, always pick up the phone. I think maybe to my own like detriment, I was like really good at like arguing, you know? So I was like, all right, we doing this again. All right, let's do this, you know, for a while. And it became this thing of like sparring for a while. And I felt like I was engaging him and, and being a good brother by getting into the ring with him. But after a while, I'm like, but wait, this is not serving anybody. Like, I don't see two people coming here with the objective of really just being cool and acceptance. I see it as just you trying to, to get me to accept your truth or to deny my own. And, and when I realized that that wasn't the common objective at a certain point, I, I just, I got tired. I was like, you know, I'm good. Like, you know what, you think about it like longer for a while. But I remembered that I felt confident to tell him the truth because I felt confident that I didn't need his acceptance. Mm, and mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. was something that I had to remind myself over and over again. And, you know, throughout my life and well, in many aspects. That's of my powerful, life, yeah. For sure. And then I also said, you know, but you know what? Acceptance is nice when it does happen. So let me take a little break from family. And then I went and I told my best friend, Sabine, who I grew up with, and we've been best friends since we were 13 and we still are. And I told her and she was amazing. And then I told, you know, some, some other friends and they were amazing. When I came out to like that group of guy friends, they were just to a person, just like they just said the things that you didn't know you were always waiting to hear. Like, you're still the same Z, you know, you're still the same guy, you know, don't front, blah, blah, blah. I put up with all the stupid questions, all my straight friends saying to me for years, like, yo Z, do gay guys be like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, all right, to speak for all, you know, gay okay. people, <laughs> and, you know, most of the time it would be like, okay, look, we're not all saying this. Sometimes it'd be like, yeah, gay people don't like that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't ever do that. Um, that kind of thing. So my friends them. were amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's my like giving back to the community, you know? <laughs> Friends were amazing. And that was the cycle of like, I created space between me and the people I loved because I needed to find myself in this safe way with this new community that my boyfriend's community that became my own that I embraced. And then I came back when I felt like strong enough to, to do that. I did that with my brother. I sparred with him for a while. It didn't work out. So then I went back to what I thought would be kind of a safer place. And I, so I started coming out to friends and then they lifted me up again. And then that cycle repeated again. And after a while I said, okay, I'm ready to try this family thing out again. And then one by one, I, I cycled through my siblings who were living in the States. I didn't want to burden any of my family who was living in Yemen with like a secret that they couldn't talk about over mm -hmm. there or, or mm -hmm. to do it over the phone. So I did it with my siblings one by one in New York. And, you know, they had generally different reactions. You know, some said more, some said less. You know, one or two said they had some suspicions, things like that. My older sister was mainly upset that I told someone else first, you know, uh -huh. she then became like, wait, what, what is what's wait, the problem with this know? again? I know, right? You, that, yeah. <laughs> but then, you know, the religious thing was a theme for, for several people. That was an issue. Now, did you grow up pretty religious? Was your family very religious? It was the way we lived our lives, our cultural traditions. You know, we come from a place like Yemen where, you know, 97% of people uh, call themselves, you know, Muslim. Mm -hmm. And the common immigrant experience of when you come here, you hold on to certain aspects of your tradition even harder because you feel like you're at war with this other culture, which is threatening to, from the parents' perspective, to drown out 
uh, the cultural identity that they themselves grew up with, mm-hmm. that they always dreamed of imparting onto their kids. And so it was this kind of like tug and war, even though, for example, my father, I, I never really saw him really observant other than on holidays in terms of like prayer and things like that. But Yet I always knew that with certain things, he would expect people to say, get married in an Islamic way or, uh, you know, saying certain like, you know, prayers before you eat or certain things like that. My mom, what it was really the only one for a long time to, you know, pray five times a day, um, always wore a headscarf. My older sister had to wear a headscarf when she was younger. So certain aspects of that expression, Mm -hmm. the way culture and religion and tradition kind of all bleed together, even in ways where in certain circumstances where they didn't themselves heed the tenets of the the scripture, you could never openly say that it was wrong. You know, mm-hmm. it was more just like you keep it on the low kind of thing. But right. um, but yet you could never profess that it was wrong or say something else was better or openly declare that you reject it. You know, that right, was right. would be an attack essentially on our cultural identity. So now you've told your brothers, you've come out to your brothers and... Does it feel like you've put a burden on them that now they hold a secret that they have to conceal to their families, to their children, to their wives? And how does that manifest itself in the relationship that then you now continue having with them? Yeah, that's an insightful question because I think what you pick up on is is the fact that that family, you know, like what you were talking about before, when you come out to someone you, you do it because you say you don't want to lie. And it's very often from this perspective of, I want to unburden myself, but I also want to live like a truthful life and hopefully have a better relationship with you. But you kind of forget, like once you tell it to that person, like their concerns may not be just about like you live in your fabulous gay life, you know, like they, they're going to take it in there with a grain of salt, like with, and from their own perspective and, and their own priorities now will come to the fore. And with my brothers, I don't think it was necessarily now I have the burden of this secret, but rather what they found out or confirmed was that there is a family secret that could ruin all of us. And this is like, you know, the Yemeni community is very insular and, you know, and everyone, everyone knows everyone. For a while, I didn't want to go into like a Yemeni, like bodega, because every time you walk in, they start talking, they know you're Yemeni immediately, you know, because you make eye contact when they're talking in Arabic and they they, they catch you, you know, they catch those eyebrows, Mm -hmm, you know, they know mm -hmm. what's going on. And then the first question they ask you is, you know, you know, what's your name? And what's your name has more weight when a Yemeni asks you because your middle name is always your father's name, whether you're a boy or girl. And your last name in the villages, villages are often named after the people who live there. So if I say my first name, middle name, and last name, they know my daddy, they right. know they where know they're the from, whole family. Uh-huh. they know the clan, you know, right. like that. And, uh, you know, and the New Yorkers are like, oh, y'all got that store in Ozo Park, blah, 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 <laughs> whatever. You know, that's how it goes. It's the network. It's just like that. So if you came in with your gay friends or wearing those cute little booty shorts, like whatever, it's just like, you know, that's the thing. It's like, people <laughs> like oh, going to yeah, that's that one like, oh, from shit. that family and yeah. that clan. I'm like, I think, <laughs> you know, it's like, can, can we please find a Puerto Rican bodega, please? You know, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I was the old New York, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm got eyes Come everywhere on. now. You're in Queens, you know? there's plenty of options. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> the Korean I, park is in the corner. Not, not, not anymore, man. It's just all you oh, now. God. But yeah, it was this thing about like the community yeah. and and you know what and I, I did recognize that as truth in the sense that they chose to still be part of this community and you know their communities of friends of their circles were mainly Yemenis these are people who really embraced a lot of these kind of cultural norms these doing things for the sake of tradition which I very clearly rejected from a young age way before I came out for, for many reasons and it would affect them it would affect their standing in that community that name that I mentioned you know, if it's a lofty name, it is because of, of many factors and this held aloft by all of these people who respect you, who think highly of you. Uh-huh. And that's everything, you know, it's so important, you're standing. And I always felt this pressure that like, if people in the community found out, then what, like my my nieces and nephews can't get married in this community or, you know, someone won't let someone else as a business partner in the store or this kind of thing, like whatever. Right, right. Or my family who's still living back in Yemen, if it gets back there, like people talk, you know? And if it got back there and my dad went to some like social event and someone asks, oh, why is your son, your, your only one of your seven kids who's not married? Oh, that's strange. You know, Zuhair is, you know, is like, he's a nice guy. He has a, job, he has a good job. Why is it blah, blah, blah. And then, and then if someone there knows and then that look and just that fear or, you know, and, and this idea of just like hurting my family, mm, like it was mm. always that guilt mm-hmm, and that pressure. And they felt that. And I think immediately my siblings consciously or subconsciously or, or some mixture 
kind of pivoted towards they are now the protectors of our family name. And I think our interactions and that example I gave you of my brother coming back to me and all that stuff, I think a lot of it was like, this can't be the case for our family. Like, can't do this to us kind of thing. And I think that's a big part of where those interactions were coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you so? Are you still now with your French boyfriend and that community? Because it sounds to me like that was such a pivotal point in your life, being able to witness how a very self-assured, aware, liberated gay person could live their life and have that community of friends and lifestyle and not have any fear and lies mm -hmm. anymore. And you decide to take that road, right? And now you're at this crossroad of family and living your life. Do your parents know in Yemen or not quite yet? That was the next and final frontier of my coming out journey for sure. My parents were still living in Yemen. I couldn't stomach the idea of telling them over the phone, but at the same time, telling them in Yemen was, was fraught in, in other ways as well. And, you know, I, I had hoped that telling my siblings would kind of be like a, a good soft landing for that. And it generally wasn't. Did so. you think that maybe your siblings were going to tell your parents and it they was, would make it a little easier or I nobody said so. anything? I didn't think so. I think because part of the thing that was coming to me was like, this will kill our parents. Like, at least from our uh, cultural you know, mindset, you have to be so deferential to your parents. I mean, literally, you know, kiss your parents' feet kind of thing. You know, and our parents, like this kind of this mythology, and it, not to say it wasn't true, but like that they work so hard for you and like now like, you, we owe our lives to them kind of thing. And I always felt like my siblings would do anything, including lie, you know, about things in their own life if it would make our, our parents feel mm -hmm. good. Sometimes there's a cloak. Sometimes it's like doing it for your parents, but it's like, are you doing this for, for you too? You know, is it because you can't face the truth kind of thing or are you really protecting them? And I only at, at some point started to really ask myself that question, but I didn't know how to approach talking to my parents when, as I mentioned, they moved back when I was 13. You know, I always loved them and we had nice conversations, but it never really went deep. You know, I was in a way kind of the baby of the family because even though I had a little sister, she was way closer to my parents because she moved back to Yemen with them when they did. So I had really the least time with them. You know, I would see them every now and then, maybe every other summer when I would go there where they would come here. And But after the point that I came out, I was terrified of being an out person in Yemen, mm -hmm. especially at one point when some of my siblings knew and they mm -hmm. weren't really cool about it. So like being out in Yemen with people who are not cool about it, like... I wouldn't let my mind really go to the darkest of dark places, but you know, that whole instinct of taking care of yourself. I mean, it was back to sleeping with your passport kind of thing, you know, and locking right. the door from the inside. Right. That summer, this scenario of being in Yemen when people knew, I was actually living in the Netherlands at the time. I quit my job and I moved to Amsterdam with my second boyfriend. Well, first of all, I told my parents in Yemen that I went there for a job. I couldn't tell them to I went To Amsterdam. To Amsterdam. Uh -huh. My siblings knew the truth, but like, all right, the job right. thing works, you know. Right. Because my parents never really knew the details of my life. Like, I think it's, I don't know if it's like an immigrant thing or it's our family or some mixture, but my mom, I talked to her on the phone. As long as you were doing well. Are you eating? Are you mm -hmm. hungry? You're hungry. I can hear it in your voice. Dad, you need money? You're good, blah, 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 blah. you know what I'm saying? Like, that's really all we got. It was unfortunate. I always kind of lamented that, but I wasn't in a position to ask for more. You know, I knew that more could be dangerous for me. And that always weighed on me. When I was living in Amsterdam, my little sister was getting married. My little sister, who I was, I was so close to. At that point, she was still living in Yemen. She was one of the only siblings that I hadn't come out to because she was younger, living in Yemen. I didn't want to burden with the secret thing. I couldn't do that. So because I couldn't tell her the truth, what could I tell her to not come to her wedding? Like I, and I, I just like, okay, I gotta go. I don't care. I'm, there's no way I'm missing my little sister's wedding. And I went and it was during that trip when I, I was so close to telling my parents and I, I, but I really hoped that my siblings would support me in doing that. And they didn't. And it was after some very tense conversations with them, I just knew that it wouldn't be safe for me there if I did that. And so I left that experience walking away feeling broken and kind of defeated because, you know, my mom had, had recently had survived breast cancer. My dad, as he's getting older, we just heard about these issues, his mm -hmm. heart, stuff like that. And I was leaving and my, my mom looked at me and she's just like, please come back and visit again. Like, we miss you. Come back every summer, study, like whatever. And I'm just like nodding, saying yes. But in my mind, I'm looking at her like, this might be the last time I ever see you. Because they were at a point where they, they weren't really coming back to the U.S. anymore, like as they were the first couple of years after they left, because we were older now, they sold their business, all that. So I didn't expect that they would come back to the U.S. anymore. And, you know, you're supposed to go to where your parents are to see them. 
in my mind, I couldn't tell her that, that I, I was gonna, never going to come back here. But I knew I was never going to subject myself to that experience of fear in a place where I had no protection again. Of course. And so I'm looking at them, not saying like what's on my mind and just like, you know, don't forget this moment kind of thing. And just wondering like what I'm going to do. And then randomly, I'd say like maybe two summers later, I had, it was back in New York by this point, well, maybe the next summer, I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, they, for some reason, they decided to come to New York to visit. They hadn't been in a couple of years. And at that point I was living on my own and I said, all right, all right, you know what? This is it. You got an, another chance at this and you got to do this. And it was so clear to me. And after I had really been in a really cold place with my older siblings who weren't you know, cool with me, you know, being out. And I should say before my little sister, eventually not long after her wedding, I came out to her and she was the only one. And to, to this day, it's just like, just was so cool about it. Not to say that she didn't have some of her own challenges to kind of, you know, balance her cultural traditions, but because she grew up separate from us, all she cared about was, I want to know everything. I want to know about every boy. I want to know when you go going out. She just wanted to be part of something, right, you know. Right. So and she loves you. She yeah. loved me. And yeah. I, we we're like these two sensitive ones who always are really comfortable sharing mm -hmm. that. And she just decided like, I'm not going to let that go for anything. So who mm -hmm. cares? You know, mm -hmm. do your thing. But besides her, I knew that I needed my older siblings or I felt like I needed them to be on board because I didn't really know how to talk to my parents about this stuff. And it really was from the perspective of, that making sure that they're okay, helping them understand. They're not going to ask me the deep questions. I'll say something and then I leave and then they'll talk to my siblings and then my siblings will have to essentially pick up the rest of the conversation. We just didn't have that practice of, of having kind of real conversation, mm. real sharing, mm -hmm. real intimacy. And so I felt like I needed them. So for that summer, it was just a whole like campaign and of trying to get them on board. And I felt like I was being so earnest, so clear. I was appealing to what I thought were there their most important values that I felt like this has to resonate with you. You know, you talk about family. My parents come, they're bouncing your kid on their lap. They're going to your home. Your wife's cooking for them. They're sharing all this. You know, you're so happy to host them and be a good son to them and all that. You talk about family, loyalty, all this stuff. Like, you understand that's important. You know that. My parents are sick. Like, what if, like, you know, this is like their last, you know, summer you understand why I want this, right? Why this is so important. Like, I want to be able to share a little bit of my life just like the way you are. Like, I, I, to me, it was so clear. And they just would not, they could not. They just, I don't hold it against them. They just could not. Like, they, they really believe that I would be killing my parents. Like, it was as if telling them was a pillow and like, and they were just in a hospital and it was, they would flatline. And I knew to some extent, they just thought they were more fragile than they were. But then as these conversations got more intense, they were like, well, you know, a couple of years ago, like dad asked, like, is, is, is he gay? But I'm like, wait, 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 they've been asking you out for all this time and y'all making up some shit. They're like, oh yeah, dad, but he has some Chinese girlfriend and, he and she's not Muslim and he don't want to tell you. And he gets mad if you ask him, so don't ask him about it. Oh I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Are you for real? Like this whole, y'all have been like putting scaffolding over like this infractured relationship to me and my parents for years talking like they can't take the truth. Meanwhile, they straight up asked you, right. you know, more than once. And that shit was like, oh, okay, okay. You know what? Forget y'all. Like you, you did down for this or not. And the whole, you know, it was for their, their whole thing, you know, and they all came out of it different ways, you know, but like it was basically denied till you die was the message. And I was like, all right, understood. Goodbye. You know, kind of thing. And I was like, look, I'm doing this, you know, with or without you. And then, in long story short, my, you know, my older sister who was not on board, but uh, I could at least have a conversation with, she actually kind of admitted her hypocrisy in the situation because she was almost a maternal figure to me when my, when my mom moved back and she was like, I taught you to never lie, but here I am telling you to lie. I just can't right. you know, see my parents taking this well, but if you are going to tell them then, you know, and she was willing to be a part of it. So I could talk to her about it on the day that I had made the plan. My parents were staying at my sister's house. I said, I'm going to come over after work and I'm going to talk to them. And I was scared, but I was going to do it. And then my sister called and we had so many conversations about it. And the last minute she was like, look, don't come. Let me tell them. And I'll just see how they take it. I was literally researching, like, in case my dad jumped at me, like how to pin him down without hurting him. Right. But, but oh, that he can't gosh. fuck me up. You know what I'm saying? Right, but I don't right, want right. to hurt him. I'm like, all right, we'll do it in a park where he can't like kill me but like right. you know, there's people around something, oh you know, my something. goodness I was, so when she said that after all that fight and I thought about it and I'm just like all right if they would take it better and she, she appealed to me like look I think it'll be much better for them if it comes from me it's less confrontational blah 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 and then I was, I was just so weak at that point and I said all right and I said okay 
like, and we went over, like, if you're going to don't, you don't have to say all that, just tell them and tell them that if they, when they're ready to talk, I want to talk. Let me say most of it, but you can like break that ice, but say when they're ready to talk, I want to talk. And so I didn't come and I made it clear, like they should reach out to me if they want to talk. And then a couple of days went by and I didn't hear anything. And so, you know, it was weighing on me. And then one day I come home. And I, I got out of the train and I got to my apartment. And as I'm, you know, putting down my work bag, I look at my phone, I have a voicemail and it's my mom. And my mom uh, in the message that I kept for years and at some point it like auto deleted, but it was a like, quiet and I heard her, she just said my name and it was quiet for a while. And then she just said, you know, Zahir, like, you know, you're my son and you know, I love you now maybe more than ever, you know, and it was like wild. It was wild. Just like, I think she misunderstood and she thought I didn't want to see her after this. So she was like sad, but trying to give me space, you know? So I have broke down. Like whenever, like I, if I get deep in the story, I, I, I do. And I just, I broke down, man. It was just like a lifetime of baggage. You know, you, you know, you can't explain that feeling unless you've gone through it. And I listened to the voicemail, you know, and, um, and then I, I made a date to see them. You know, it wasn't some warm bear hug kind of thing. It was a polite business discussion, polite, but firm negotiation. Uh -huh. And my mom kind of sent this. She always, you know, I had tended to defer to my dad. You know, my dad wasn't part of that voicemail, but I knew how she felt deep down. And the conversation when I saw them was more my dad talking. I was like, look, there's some terms. You're our son. We love you no matter what. But no one in the community can know. And mm -hmm. I was like, look, I don't care. That's not my community. I'm not going to go out and tell all your people. If you don't want to tell them, don't, don't fucking tell them. Like, right, I don't right, care. Right. You know? And he's like, two, uh, you have to commit to seeing a doctor and trying to fix yourself. And three was, we're never going to talk about this again. Two was like, and I said straight up, it's like, um, well, that's not happening because I'm not sick, so I'm not going uh -huh. to a doctor. And three, never going to talk about it. That's your decision to make. But what I'll tell you is this. I am never going to lie to you again about anything, ever, no matter what it is. So if you ask me a question, you better be ready for the answer. Exactly. And if you ain't ready, don't, don't ask. And like straight up. Any words that we share from this day on will come from the heart. We got to make up for lost time. You know, it's been too long. And he knew that that wasn't a negotiation at that part. And they said, okay. And, you know, consistency is a virtue in some instances, but uh, they've pretty much held the line on that, you know. But our relationship is infinitely better. My siblings thought that my parents would die who gave me all this shit like They're going to have years. a heart and attack. They're they were kind of like yeah. stunned. I, honestly, I was, in my mind, I was like walking by looking at them like, yeah, yeah, what? You know, kind of thing. Like, look, they take that shit better than you. And they're fucking like, that's the kind of the way I took it, you know? <laughs> exactly. And, and I don't mean to put my siblings in like a bad space. Like you said, like they've gone through a lot and they were in positions where for a different reason, they maybe were in a position where they could have done something or pursued something that would have been kind of against cultural traditions mm -hmm, and had mm -hmm. to make decisions. And you mm -hmm. define yourself by that. And I knew that they were thinking about like my parents with that, but I, I just felt like there was never a real ability to be vulnerable. And my parents, you know, I, I wouldn't say they were especially vulnerable like with that, you know, again, but they at least respected me. They mm -hmm. at least, mm -hmm. they never asked me to lie. They never put me in a bad position anymore. And then slowly they began to share more with me and, and be truthful to me about things that they never shared with me before. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful. And yeah. it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I felt like finally, like I wasn't just like the baby boy of the family thing. I could have a real conversation with my dad. And I say, I go back to my dad a lot because mom said that, that one thing I needed to hear. There's a part of you that almost feels greedy asking for more than that. Mm -hmm. I, I got like, mm -hmm. you know, and my dad never said anything like that in response to the gay thing. But, you know, as he's gotten older, he's become so much more tender and the transformation is more of a 180 in him. He mm. was the tough guy mm -hmm. who you practically couldn't look in the eye when he got home from work for most of the life that I, I lived with him in New York. And now he's just this like emotional, like tender, like, you know, it's, it's so sweet. And I can express that to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I'm at a point where I ask myself the question, like, I pushed the line one. Is it up to me to push the line again with them? And I'm, I'm still at a point where I'm like, how much should I share? You know, my parents don't know about, you know, my partner of, of four and a half years, at least to my knowledge. In mm -hmm. fact, most of my siblings don't, but just because we don't really talk, unfortunately. Right. Just they don't want to ask. They don't want to know. But I'm sure that someplace it sounds that they all recognize how courageous 
you have been and being able to live your truth, you know, whereas who knows what your brothers are incapable of divulging because of the cultural norms in your society. I think regardless of whether one agrees or not, I mean, there is a level of having to acknowledge that for you to be able to open up yourself and to be able to tell them about your life under all those conditions, that they have to respect you for that and love you for that. And they'll open up as they can. And I think everybody has their own journey, but I think to slowly keep opening that door by being able to talk to them about your life can only enhance that relationship. I think you're spot on. You know, it's taken a long time, you know, for me, because as I've went in this other direction and kind of, you know, built my life, my community, I'm also very protective of that, you know? Like I would never introduce my partner to anyone who I didn't feel like would fully respect him. And if there's even a small question of that, you know, I'm very protective. And, you know, to be fair, a lot of like my siblings who I don't talk to very much, they have reached out to me many times and in in certain ways where they'll say, oh, you know, come over for dinner. Let's do this. So, you know, we should be close and all that. But for me, it goes back to, but wait, you're not really inviting me over. If I have to remember the script before I walk into the house, if your wife can't know about me or if I have to make up some story in front of the kids. That to me is not an invitation, you know what I mean? For At least for me, it's for the person that you wish I was. And I've tried to explain that to them for a while and I kind of just stopped, you know? It was like, nah, this is this is not serving anybody. But I don't want to make it seem like, you know, like there's, there's not any warmth. And, and the truth is like a lot of these invitations have come from them, but I think we just can't get to this agreement of maintaining a line of respect as I need it to be I don't expressed. think they understand that. Yeah, it yeah. takes it takes a while. I mean, I've went through similar, oh, oh, you're going to bring your friend? Oh, the person has a name and she's not my friend. Yeah, right? you know, exactly. Your roommate, you know, whatever they want to call That's it for so thing. many years. Yeah. I couldn't imagine bringing like the partner who I love so much into that. You know what I'm saying? Meanwhile, we've been together for a couple of years. I met his family like 10 times. I went home for the holidays, all that. And I'm not like comparing, like things are different. It's wildly different scenarios. Like I know what time it is with all that stuff. So, you know, it's apples to oranges in a lot of ways. And, you know, my friends and family are so sweet. But yeah, I think it's important to share this because you know, it's not like you coming out and then it's all roses. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. These these stories, depending Mm -hmm. on your circumstances, it can be really just like a lifetime of either struggling or, you know, kind of drawing the line and then saying, wait, did I draw the line on the sand a little too fast? Should I reinvest in this? It's these questions that you may always have to weigh on and as as it's important to you. And I, I think it's important to kind of show that spectrum that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily think that they're going through things like this, but these stories from decades ago still play a role in their life and mm-hmm. still are things that, that we have to think about. Right. Do you have any regrets or uh, of what you could have done better or differently? And what do you feel is the importance of coming out? And do you think it is important for people to come out? I certainly don't feel any regrets. You know, one of the things that I've always thought about in terms of, you know, like I, I think I mentioned to you before, the first time I came out to my brother and I was like, I had this idea of, you know, I have a community and I feel supported. I feel loved. And so I can be honest with you at risk of losing you because I'm anchored to something, you know? And sometimes when you can't, you should ideally be anchored in a love and respect for yourself and the person you always were and the soul that, you know, that you were born into, that we spend our lives trying to to realize and to get to know. But sometimes in those weak moments, it's, it's okay to rely on support from your community. And I had to do that. And so I will never have any regrets because I always knew that things that I went through that were really difficult also were the things that kind of prepared me for the best things in my life. The steps that I took in the darkness where I felt like I was, I didn't know where I was going and I was lost. Eventually when the sun came up and I was in this better place, I wouldn't have gotten to that spot if not for all those steps you took during the long night. And you realize that those two things are inextricable. You know, they become part of you. They're not these separate things. And so when I thought about it like that, when I, when I think about the relationships I have, the relationships that I don't have, I never feel bad about it because the decisions I've made or things that I've done that maybe have been kind of at the heart of a loss of, of, of certain relationships have been at the heart of the greatest gifts I've ever received. And so how could I possibly feel a regret if I've been blessed with so much? 
in terms of the importance of coming out, you know, I know there's some things that's like a to each your own situation, but I think this is everybody's own. I talk about my family in Yemen. I have full deference. Look, if, if you're in a place where coming out means you're in danger, you got to take care of yourself. I mean, coming out, it should be for your own benefit. And if that's not to your benefit, then, you know, you got to know that. And I see that. And I always, you know, with, with people who I know who come from places where that is also the case, there's absolutely a bonding experience over that because it's this primal thing in you. It's like when you've experienced that fear, it changes you. But to the extent that you possibly can, you absolutely owe it to yourself. As I think I said before, you have to give people in your life an opportunity to see you, to love you, to know you, to embrace you. They can't do that unless you let them. And that was like really at the crux of my decisions like to come out to people. It's like, wait, this person loves me, but yet I don't even have enough faith in them that if I was to tell them about this thing, despite the fact that you know they've known me since I was a kid, that I don't have faith that they would still love and respect me. And I'm just deciding this for them. And I realized it'd be better to give them the option and let them walk away. Because if that was the case, that would be their decision. That's on them, but it's not on me anymore. And so when you come out for the sake of being honest, it doesn't really matter what happens after that because you've already done yourself a very valuable service. And you will see yourself in a more clear way the next time you look in the mirror than you did before, regardless of what happened. And it will strengthen all of your existing and future relationships because you know who you are and you have now made yourself available to be loved in equal measure. Thank you, Zahair. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for being here and telling your story, sharing your story and putting it out there in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. For more, subscribe to Sundays at Cafe Tabac, the podcast. You can also learn more about us and our film at cafetobacfilm.com and at Cafe Tabac Film on social media. Please share your thoughts with us. And if you have a coming out story that you'd like to share, reach out to us. This episode was recorded at the newsstand studio at Rockefeller Center here in the heart of New York City. Special thanks to Joseph Hazen and Karen Song for their support. See you next time.